Hi, good evening, all of you. Good evening. Very good evening, sir. Very good evening. Sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, Very good evening. Hi. Hi. So I just tested that if I am audible or not. <laughs> of course, I wish good evening to all of you. Thanks. You are very much audible, sir. Okay, Dr. Sadik, uh, uh, we are live. Uh, Hi, we are live. Good evening. Good evening. Very good evening, sir. Very good evening. Good evening, sir. Very good evening. Hi. Hi. So good evening, sir. Sir, Dr. Bharat uh, is moderating this uh, session, so he is going to start now. Dr. Bharat, please go ahead. We are live now. <coughs> So, uh, good evening all. Uh, I, Dr. Bharat Padivan, Associate Professor at Department of Anesthetical Care, Ames, Jodhpur, uh, will be moderating uh, today's session. And I welcome you all. Uh, with the permission of Chair Indrani Ma'am and Vishal Singla sir and Naveen Malhotra sir, we will begin the today's proceedings. Uh, to begin with, first of all, I would like to invite Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, Professor and Head Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care in Jodhpur uh, to uh, give the welcome address. Good evening, all of you. Uh, uh, on the behalf of the city branch of uh, RSCP Jodhpur, I welcome you all to this webinar. So, um, uh, you know, all the speakers, participants, uh, and uh, uh, the listeners, uh, they are all welcome to this webinar. and. Uh, I would specifically uh, like to mention Vishal Singla and uh, Dr. Naveen. Uh, they have been doing untiring efforts in organizing these webinars for last uh, more than a year, I'm sure, about one and a half years, I guess. So it is always difficult to organize uh, and to find interesting topics and interesting uh, speakers. But uh, they have somehow managed it and managed it quite well. So uh, kudos to uh, the team. And... Uh, uh, and I would also like to invite Dr. Ripul Kaushik, uh, who has uh, spared his time and uh, who is uh, five hours behind us. Dr. Vanda Mangal, uh, you are also welcome. Dr. Raj Shekhar from Mangalagiri. Gansham from Mangalagiri, my student, my dear student, but now an associate professor. Can I, can I call you my student still, Gansham? Uh, Dr. Sadik and all of you. So over to uh, Dr. Bharat to uh, conduct this program webinar. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, to begin with, I will request uh, uh, our office bearers and patrons uh, to say two words. Uh, first of all, look, I would like to welcome founder member and patron, uh, Dr. Tej Paul, Tej Paul, sir, to say two words, few words. Dr. Bharat, uh, Dr. Tej Paul, sir, has not joined yet. Okay, then I would request Dr. Indrani H. Kumar, President RACP, uh, to say a few words to grace the occasion. Thank you so much. I think the topic for today is the, the in thing for all anesthesiologists who are practicing orthopedic surgery. I mean, the way regional nerve blocks has taken off is really mind-blowing. And of course, with it, we know how important it is to, uh, to learn uh, peripheral nerve blocks because of all the advantages it offers to the patient by you know, reducing all the complications of gentle anesthesia, reducing opi opioids, I think, requirement and things like that. So today's uh, uh, webinar will definitely Sir, the hospital must take it. Of how to, what are the various blocks which are, uh, which are useful for hip and knee uh, surgeries, and uh, I'm really looking forward to listen to the speakers and to the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, our president-elect, Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir, to pay, say a few words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bharat. Uh, heartiest congratulations to team RSSP Jodhpur, uh, led by our editor-in-chief, Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, sir, and uh, ably supported by Bharat, Manoj, and the ex-students. It's always pleasure. I can understand the feeling of joy and pleasure on the face of Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, sir, when he's saying uh, Dr. Gansham and Dr. Uh, the ex-students 
and we are now doing a, a good job as community also. I know Gansham and Rashika, they are doing good at uh, Mangalagiri and uh, uh, they will be, the program is also very well designed with the experts like Dr. Vanda Mangal and uh, people sharing their uh, inputs about the uh, peripheral nerve blocks and it's nice. Uh, welcome Dr. Vipul Kaushik uh, for joining us from uh, UK and uh, definitely we also have uh, uh, Dr. Sadiq also from joining locally from Jodhpur. And uh, Dr. will be supported by Dr. Shubha Parik, Dr. Rakesh, and Dr. Rashmi from Jodhpur. So my best wishes uh, for such a nice program. Artesh, congratulations once again. Long live RSSCP. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our secretary, uh, Dr. Vishal Singla, sir, uh, the backbone of all our events and well supported by Indrani, ma'am. So, uh, Vishal Singh, sir, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bharat, sir. Uh, greetings from RSSAP, respected uh, President, ma'am, Dr. Indrani, madam, President elect, Dr. Nabin Mahotra, sir, Editor in Chief, Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, sir, uh, and all the faculty members, Dr. Ghansham, Dr. Raj Shekhar, Dr. Sade, Dr. Vandra Mandal, ma'am, Dr. Kashyap, and uh, the organizing chairperson of today's program, of course, Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, sir. I would also like to extend my thanks to Dr. Swati Chhabra, who is not here, is in Canada and uh, was uh, was instrumental in bringing hold of this program live today. Today's webinar regarding the peripheral nerve blocks in hip and knee surgeries is, uh, is a wonderful topic. And I would like to thank, congratulate uh, Team Jodhpur for selecting topics, which would be very useful to anesthesiologists across all the platforms. The... Success to any webinar is by uh, active contribution of the speakers as well as the chairpersons. So I'm really thankful to all the faculty who will be deliberating today. And I'm sure today's webinar will be quite enriching for, for all of us. I extend my best wishes to the faculty and the organizing team, Team Jodhpur. Uh, also, I would like to uh, give special thanks to Dr. Nabin Malhotra, sir, for constantly pushing us for maintaining high standards. Dr. Sunil Sethi, sir, treasurer RCCP to push for pushing us constantly to maintain high standards. Also, Mr. Chaubeji, to who is providing us the technical support for providing this program live on anesthesia television and on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much and long live RCCP. I'm looking forward to the this uh, academic feast. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vishal, sir. Uh, so now we will be uh, starting our academic session. The first uh, to begin uh, <coughs> will be sensitive blocks for hip and knee joint. For that, first of all, I would like to invite the chairperson for the session. Uh, our first uh, chairperson is Dr. Rakesh Kumar. He is associate professor at the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care, AIMS Jodhpur. So I am sharing my screen. The tricolor balloons in the back backdrop of Dr. Ashmi are appreciated. Thank you, sir. Uh, so he has more than 55 publications in national and international generation, generation and uh, uh, more than 110 citations. He is a fellow of Indian Diploma of Regional Anesthesia. His areas of interest are regional anesthesia and pain medicine, cardiac anesthesia, and he, he was the past secretary of, of the National uh, Conference on Difficult Airway. So we welcome you, Dr. Rakesh. Our next... Uh, Chairperson for the session is Dr. Rashmi Sayal. She is currently working as Assistant Professor in Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at Dr. SN Medical College, Jodhpur. Welcome, Dr. Rashmi. Rashmi, uh, can you hear us? Rashmi, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, so, uh, uh, we welcome you, both the chairpersons. And uh, now I would uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Rakesh Kumar to introduce the first speaker of the session, Dr. Raj Shekhar. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
good evening to all thank you uh, bharat sir sir uh, okay. i will be sharing the cv yeah yeah good evening to all uh, our is today uh, first speaker is dr m rajshekar he, he is currently working uh, as a senior resident at uh, all india institute of medical science mangalagiri uh, he did his M md from nimens uh, sorry nims uh, hyderabad and his area of interest is regional anesthesia pain and palliative care uh, over to dr rajshekar thank you sir you can share your slides yes, yes sir good evening one and all before uh, we begin the session i would like to thank the team of rscacp for giving me this opportunity i feel very privileged to be speaking in the presence of uh, uh, likes of you and i thank dr gansham sir for guiding me during the preparation of this session before we So before we begin this session, let us uh, consider the reasons why we need sensory blocks. So uh, there are many blocks. Dr. Rajshekar, Dr. Rajshekar, uh, please, uh, I think uh, you change the in a uh, presentation mode. You change to presentation. No, sir, mode. it's in slideshow mode only, sir. Ah, uh -huh, yes, in slideshow, but it is not in uh, slideshow mode right now. Initially, it was, but then. i think your uh, connection was interrupted and then it's only in ppt mode sir now sir not yet not yet now sir no it is not still uh, still it is not it's still it is in ppt mode not in presentation mode yeah yes. now it is now it is now it is please go ahead okay. now it is but i'm i'm able to change the slides sir in this There's a challenge. She can continue in this mode. It seems legible. Is it visible now, ma'am? No, it's in the same mode. It has not come to the slideshow mode. Agreed. But then, if there is a challenge of change, changing the slides, Doctor Doctor Rajshekar, if you if you are not able to somehow handle it, should I start it from here, from my end? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. is it okay yes sir please go ahead i'm sorry for the glitch before uh, beginning uh, the act the topic proper uh, why do we need sensory blocks there are lot of blocks which we practice in our day to day life in the practice of regional anesthesia yes, which provide adequate analgesia yeah, but uh, they, uh, they have uh, they provide adequate perioperative analgesia yeah, but at the cost of some motor weakness so motor weakness when it present when it is present it uh, causes immobilization and uh, uh, un unnecessary bedriddenness of the patient uh, the, the surgeries which are uh, around the hip and the knee are usually done in patients uh, who are uh, elderly the uh, patients who are 
uh, ab above 65 or 70 years of age who, for whom there are a lot of uh, complications when, uh, due to immobilization also. So when we practice sensory blocks alone, the motor component can be uh, left out and the patient can be mobilized early. And this prevents the rela rela complications related to immobility. And uh, this has a very positive outcome on the positive effect on the outcome of the patient. Uh, uh, we can enhance the recovery and the patient can be discharged from the hospital faster, thus bringing down the hospital charges significantly. This has a greater acceptability from the operating team too. Before we dive into the topic, let us recall what Hilton's law says. It says that the nerve, in, nerve supplying the muscles, extending directly across and acting at the given joint, not only supply the muscle, but also innervates the joint and the skin overlying the muscle. In simple terms, uh, the, the muscle, the, 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 the joint and the muscle crossing the joint and causing mob mobility of the joint and this overlying skin are supplied by the branches of the same nerve. This was postulated by John Hilton in his speeches series of lectures between 1860-62. So in this uh, lecture, we briefly discuss about the innervation of the knee and the hip joint, the basic anatomy of adductor canal, femoral canal, fem femoral triangle, and the uh, three, principally three blocks, spine block, adductor canal block, and the eye pack. First coming to the hip joint. So we can see the sense of, uh, let us start with this in sensory innervation of the hip joint. First coming to the anterior capsule, we can see that the hip joint is supplied by the lumbar and the sacral plexus, the femoral, the, uh, the, the terminal branches of the lumbar and the sacral plexus. The femoral nerve comes and travels along the knee, lateral border of the psoas major, whereas the obturator and the uh, uh, accessory obturator nerve, whenever they are present, come along the medial border or sometimes even more medially. The anterior capsule of the hip joint is supplied by femoral nerve and obturator nerve principally, and in about 30% of the population, the accessory obturator nerve also supplies, also gives articular uh, branches. Here we can see that this is the pubic ramus. Here the, this is the accessory obturator nerve and the femoral nerve, it is more lateral. The obturator nerve with its anterior and posterior branches is a more medially and along, uh, uh, it is near the uh, 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 pubic ramus. So the idea is to, uh, in, during giving, while giving a pen block, the articular branches of the hip joint are around the pubic, between the pubic ramus and the, so a bit below the psoas tendon. So during pen block, this is the area of interest. The posterior capsule is innervated principally by the terminal branches of the sacral plexus, which includes sciatic nerve, superior luteal nerve, nerve to quadratus femoris and inferior luteal nerve. But the posterior capsule innervation is predominantly pro proprioception and the nociception is predominantly seen by the innervation of the anterior capsule, 70% roughly. Next slide. This is to summarize, the anterior capsule is innervated by the obturator nerve, femoral nerve and the accessory obturator nerve. The posterior capsule is supplied by the superior gluteal nerve, sciatic nerve, nerve to quadratus femoris, and the inferior gluteal nerve. Coming to the first block, the peri, uh, pericapsular nerve group block, shortly called PENG block, was first described by Jaron and Arango in the year 2018 in regional anesthesia and pain medicine. Uh, they have described about this procedure in around five patients in their first article. In, in whom they have identified a musculofacial plane between the psoas tendon anteriorly and the pubic ramus posteriorly, where the articular branches from the three uh, principal three nerves arise and are pre present. This is the uh, iliacus muscle. This is the psoas tendon. This is the anterior superior, anterior inferior iliac spine. And it continues as the in uh, ilio iliopectineal eminence, ischiopec the, this Ischiopectineal eminence IPE continues as the pubic ramus. Here we can see the pectineous muscles along with the uh, femoral vessels. The ind indications of pepang block is indicated for perioperative analgesia of hip surgeries, acetabular and pelvic fractures, and for positioning while administering central neuraxial blockades for hip procedures. It is a site of interventional pain procedures for chronic hip pain and in pediatric population with uh, in sickle cell anemia 
with vasoocclusive crisis where the patient presents with hip pain uh, pain block can be given but the available data on safety and efficacy is very limited around 70 articles have been published from 2018 after the block was first described and no specific uh, indications are defined by far for performing a pen block, we use a low frequency curvilinear probe and place it transversely over the anterior superior iliac spine. And then we rotate the probe around 45 degrees angle uh, in clockwise direction when we are operate, when we are performing the procedure on the right hip and in anti-clockwise direction uh, when we are performing the procedure in the left hip. So after rotation, we get to see the anterior ilia, uh, inferior iliac spine and the that is the AIS, AISS, AIIS and the IPE, iliacus muscle and the psoas tendon and the femoral vessels come into the view. More medially, we see the pectineus muscle also. We, ta we target the area between the psoas tendon and the pubic ramus where the articular branches are present and we deposit around 15 to 20 ml of the drug at this target site. So here, this is this is uh, 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 the image we get, the sonographic image we get when once we place the a curvilinear probe transversely over the ASIS. So this here is the ASIS. In the next slide, we can see we started rotating the probe, and here we can see that the psoas ligament, psoas tendon is coming into the picture. And in the second image, the AIIS is more prominently seen. And the, so, uh, so as tendon is also prominently seen, and then we move the we move the probe more medially to get the pubic ramus, the pectineus, and the femoral vessels more pr uh, prominently. So here we can see the AS, AI, uh, AIIS, the IPE line, and the pubic uh, uh, pubic ramus. Medially, we see the pectineus muscle. The psoas tendon is seen in the center. The iliacus muscle is seen over the psoas tendon. Here we also see the femoral vessels. So this is the, the target aid. Next slide. This was actually a video, but uh, I'm unable to play the video now. I'm sorry for that. So the, since the peng block is a recent uh, input into the recent uh, uh, entry into the world of regional anesthesia, there are a lot of uh, newcomers confusions in it. There are a lot of studies have been performed comparing a single block with other blocks and uh, analgesic effect was comparable when, com when, uh, 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 when mixed nerve blocks were used and studies where combination of blocks were used, the results were variable. Curvilinear probe is commonly conventionally used, but linear probe can also be used based on the patient's body habitus, in particularly in pediatric populations and in lean patients. In-plane technique is conventionally used, but out-plane technique can also be tried, but there is lack of evidence that if a lot of plane uh, can be tried when the tip of the uh, uh, needle can, we, when we can ensure that the tip of the needle is visible all the times. Landmark guided uh, peng block was described by, by one of the authors recently in a publication uh, in IJA where he described uh, the procedure as uh, where he identifies uh, uh, an image, a, a line joining the anterior superior iliac spine with the pubic tubercle. And along the line, five centimeters from the anterior superior iliac spine, a point is identified and the needle is inserted and it hit, 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 hits the bone. But uh, there is a greater risk of damage to the structures present medially and also the femoral vessels with this technique. So ultrasound guided technique is superior. Uh, usual position is the supine with neutral hip, but in pediatric populations, the supine with ab hip abduction can be necessary. Shing single shot block and continuous catheter techniques were compared with variable results. More uh, number of RCTs are necessary to throw more light on indications and the uh, procedure to be followed due to in following a peng block. Is it a true pericapsular block? To, to study this, or some cadaveric study to learn to know this, or some cadaveric studies were performed. And they have out identified that giving administering low volume of the drug will confine the uh, uh, block to the anterior capsule alone. But if we give 20 ml of the block, then it spreads to the other areas too. But this study is not enough to say it is a complete uh, periacapsular block. So the concerns with peri uh, peng block include that it is a, it is not a complete block though it, uh, though anterior capsule contributes to more than 70% of the nociception of the hip joint 
uh, iatrogenic damage. Uh, some authors have shown concerns over iatrogenic damage to the vital structures, including ureter. And uh, uh, there are some case reports where, uh, where two patients have uh, com complained of uh, quadriceps weakness following peng block. While at the point of entry, uh, uh, at the site of injection, a lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh can be injured. Since the block is uh, in close proximity to the surgical site, uh, st uh, strict aseptic precautions should be followed. And the this has acceptability concerns with the operating colleagues. Now coming to the knee joint. Knee joint is primarily, the anterior capsule of the knee joint is principally innervated by the femoral nerve and the <laughs> lateral nerve. nerve to vastus lateralis, nerve to vastus intermedius, and the, and the saphenous nerve, the patella, infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve innervates the anterior capsule of the knee. Are the, these are the branches which come from the femoral nerve. Sciatic nerve, uh, uh, give, the, the, the tibial nerve gives the inf inferior uh, inferior medial genicular nerve branch and the common peroneal nerve gives the inferior lateral and the recurrent uh, common peroneal nerve. The origin of the superior lateral genicular nerve is, uh, is variable. Sometimes it comes from the common peroneal nerve and uh, sometimes it comes directly from the sciatic nerve and sometimes it comes from the uh, uh, nerve to vastus lateralis. All the three are explained in various uh, cadaveric-based studies. The origin of superior, superior medial genicular nerve is primary, mostly, most commonly from the nerve to vastus medialis, but sometimes it can directly come from the femoral nerve also. This is the innervation of the anterior capsule of the knee joint. Next slide, sir. Sir, we lost the presentation. Hello, sir. Show me how, yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, you are audible. Yes, uh, I lost the view, sir. But the presentation Continue. is not there. Somebody needs to share the screen again. Meantime, fantastic presentation, Rajshekhar. Just keep going, Mike. Yes, sir. Rajshekhar, you share it from your end and then do it in the presentation mode. Presentation mode. Okay, sir. Yeah. I am doing that, sir. And now here we come to the posterior uh, branch. We can we can see clearly see that the posterior capsule, the posterior part of the uh, knee capsule, is predominantly innervated by the tibial nerve, while a uh, superior medial portion, a part of it, comes from the obturator nerve, posterior division, and the uh, po superior lateral component is partly supplied by the common peroneal nerve. But blocking tibial nerve in this region, for, uh, the the target. Uh, 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 for IPAC block is this region uh, or these articular branches. It is the same thing. With this. Now, this is the mapping of uh, innervation of the knee capsule. So now coming to the femoral triangle and adductor canal. Femoral triangle is uh, bounded by the inguinal ligament, the sartorius and the adductor longus. But at the apex of the femoral triangle, it continues and the adductor longus the, con uh, the boundary by the adductor longus comes down and adductor magnus comes into the picture. And at the apex, beyond the apex, the vaso adductor membrane can be seen uh, subsartorially. And uh, that is the uh, place where we find the adductor canal. So uh, here, uh, sonographically, we can, it is represented here. 
this is the femoral triangle. Point A is the proximal area where the, sub, uh, the medial boundary of the adductor canal is formed by the adductor longus muscle. Here we can see the femoral vessels. This is the vastus medialis muscle and this is the sartorius. And by at the midpoint of thigh, we can see that the artery and the vein fly uh, uh, subsartorially and uh, adductor longus is disappearing and the vastus medialis uh, is, uh, is on the lateral border. And more distally, we see the adductor magnus and uh, sartorius and the uh, vastus medialis around the artery. Here, the, we see the uh, vasoadductor membrane in which the nerves are embedded. This is the saphenous nerve which supplies the uh, articular branch, the infrapatellar branch to the anterior knee capsule, which is the target site for uh, adductor canal blockade. So when we block more proximally, more intense analgesia can be obtained, but that can cause some uh, quadriceps weakness because some motor uh, fibers are yet to branch out from here. But when we go more distally, the chances of quadriceps weakness are less, but some of the sensory branches, some of the articular branches already branch out before uh, more pro proximally uh, to this point. And so the uh, block may not be as intense as needed. Here we see from pro when we move from proximal to distal, this is the sartorius and the uh, medially we see the adductor longus uh, medial to the femoral vessels. Here the saphenous vein. And uh, at the apex, we can see that the adductor magnus comes uh, to contribute uh, in the boundaries of the adductor canal. And uh, more distally in the adductor canal, we see the subsa uh, subsartorially, we can see the vaso adductor membrane and the adductor magnus. More, me more laterally, we, see, we, see, we can still see the vastus medialis. So saphenous nerve, we pro it, it, proximally in its course, lies along with the femoral artery. At the adductor hiatus, it comes out where the femoral artery dives in, in deep, in, dives deeply into the tissues, and the saphenous nerve becomes more superficial and cutaneous. At, at the knee joint, it accompanies the inferior genicular vessels. Distal to the knee joint, it accompanies the saphenous vein. So, adductor canal block was first described by Baskar Manikim in uh, uh, in the year two thousand nine. After which, it is widely practiced. The indications include knee arthroscopy, and it can be given as a part of multimodal analgesia in knee arthroplasty and arthroscopic ACL reconstructions. And it can be supplemented along with sciatic nerve, blo sciatic nerve block uh, for lower leg surgeries, foot or ankle surgery. The distribution of saphenous nerve is, is depicted in this picture. So for, for performing an erector canal block, we need a frog-like position. We place a, 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 low, a high frequency linear probe uh, over the anterior surface of the mid thigh and we visualize the femoral shaft at this level. And the, when we move the probe more medially, we, we visualize the sartorius and the femoral vessels and the saphenous nerve in proximity with the femoral artery. Then we, if we start moving distally, the femoral nerve dives in and becomes the po popliteal arteries and the, the boundaries are changed from adductor longus to adductor magnus. We insert the needle at the desired site based on the degree of analgesia and the uh, degree of immobilization required postoperatively. About 15 to 20 ml of local anesthesia can be injected. Here we can see the probe is placed anteriorly and uh, this, is, this is the vastus medialis and this is the femoral uh, shaft. In this slide, we can see this is the sartorius, this is the femoral artery, and uh, this is the uh, vasoadductor membrane. Uh, and here are two nerves, the nerve to vastus medialis and the saphenous nerve. Here in this plane, we, we can see we, we tried to inject the saline into the subsartorial plane. Uh, we can see that the vasoadductor membrane is splitting and it is getting separated. And in the next, in this image, we can see that the, we have pierced the vasoadductor membrane and we were able to infiltrate around the uh, desired plane, around the desired nerve. So this is another patient where the uh, anterior placement of the probe shows the femur and the vastus medialis muscle. Uh, while going more medially, we can see that the sartorius is coming into the picture. And here it is a subsartorial plane, vasoadductor membrane and the femoral vessels with adductor longus and vastus medialis on either side. 
So the concerns with adductor canal block based on the level of block, degree of analgesia varies and uh, quadriceps weakness and foot drop can manifest. Uh, 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 block of the session. Infiltration between popliteal artery and capsule of the knee, uh, IPAC. It is in first developed by Dr. Sanjay Sinha, sir. And the goal of this block is to anesthetize the articular branches innervating the posterior uh, aspect, posterior capsule of the knee joint, principally by the branches of the articular branches of the tibial nerve. The two approaches are described. One, the medial approach, which is commonly conventionally used, uh, conventionally given using a curvilinear probe. A posterior approach can be used, uh, can be uh, used to give this block and uh, cur both curvilinear probe or linear probe can be used for uh, using for giving the block in posterior approach. Since it is very close to the surgical site, strict aseptic precautions should be followed and it can have some acceptability issues from the operating operating surgeons. It is widely used uh, in, the, it, it is widely indicated in total knee arthroplasties, but the further indications are being explored. When we see uh, at this level, the uh, intercon the condylar level, these are the structures we see. If we go more proximally along the medial, in, from the medial to lateral, uh, if we project the beam from this way, first we see the vastus medialis, underneath the uh, which we see the femoral shaft, and here the sartorius and the hamstring muscles. The plane of anesthesia, uh, the plane of interest is between the femor femoral shaft and the popliteal vessels. For positioning, for administering IPAC, we have approach one, which is the medial approach. We position the patient in frog-like position and we place a high, uh, low frequency curvilinear probe uh, along the medial aspect of the thigh, lower third, lower third of the thigh, and we visualize the femoral vessels. And we trace the femoral vessels distally and where the femoral vessels get converted to popliteal vessels. And uh, we, we uh, after this point, we can Mobile, move the probe more posteriorly and uh, distally the, to uh, get a better view of the interspace between the popliteal artery and the femoral capsule. Then we insert the needle between the popliteal artery and the shaft of the femur and we uh, advance the tip of the needle two centimeters to uh, beyond the uh, popliteal vessels to avoid injury to the vessels and accidental injection into the intravascular compartment. While withdrawing, we can inject into the plane between the, this uh, helps in preventing vascular injection. Here we can see the, this is the shaft of the femur. This is the vastus medialis muscle. Here the sartorius and the uh, hamstring muscles can be seen. These are the popliteal vessels and this is the plane of interest. We have to enter from this area and uh, infiltrate. Go or go ahead, go beyond two centimeters beyond the popliteal vessels and start infiltrating and come out. So, this is the plane of interest for IPAC block. So, the second approach we position the patient in frog like position. If we are supplementing this along with the adductor canal block, the same position can be continued. Uh, we use the uh, we can use a, a curvilinear probe or a linear probe uh, uh, to identify the femoral condyles, which are two hyperechoic structures, which are discontinuous and curved, and the popliteal artery can also be visualized by, by placing the probe uh, transversely on the popliteal crease. Okay. Then we move more proximally to uh, see that these condyles, and now, uh, now we can see a hyperechoic structure, which is continuous, unlike the condyles. Now we see the femoral shaft. Between uh, at this point, we identify the popliteal artery and the shaft of the femur and infiltrate in between the two uh, spaces. So here, it, a curvilinear probe is used uh, to identify the two uh, uh, two condyles of the femur, and more proximally, we see that it is continuous. The hyperechoic structure is continuous, and this is the plane in which we are interested. So one last word, before performing any block, we have to take the, the, the detailed informed consent and we have to perform the stop before the block to confirm the identity of the patient, to confirm the site of uh, block to be performed. And we have to follow strict aseptic precautions. 0.5% chlorhexidine sprayed twice, 30 seconds apart and let to dry uh, is usually practiced in our hospital. And RAPT protocol where we see the muzzle response, where that there is no muzzle response, at less than 0.5 uh, milliamperes and a frequent aspiration while injection and an injection pressure of less than 15 PSI uh, and uh,
uh, toxic dose to avoid local anesthetic systemic toxicity. The, the, the concerns of this are uh, about are uh, to be discussed by the panel panelists, the reverend panelists in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rashikar. It was a beautiful presentation, especially the figures that you showed were really informative and very illustrative. Thank you, Madam. Do we have some questions from the audience? There are no questions in the chat box right now. I will be tracking the chat box in case it pops up. I will let you know. Yeah, Dr. Rashikar, I have one or two queries. So, yeah, yeah, you said uh, that a rectal canal block, uh, which block is more uh, desirable? Uh, it's a proximal or distal uh, a approach? For, uh, so, uh, for proximal or distal, sir, yeah. uh, uh, for, for, for getting a more better sensory block alone, the distal block is preferred, sir. Okay. But now a high pack block called the uh, uh, high volume proximal adductor canal block is being explored in which high volume of drug will be uh, given at the uh, junction of the femoral apex of the femoral triangle and the uh, uh, onset the uh, where the structure of adductor canal starts at the junction between the apex of the femoral canal femoral triangle and the adductor canal that is described as the ideal site for adductor canal blocks so more the proximal <laughs> approach it is uh, chances of, is there any chances of uh, uh, quadriceps uh, weakness yes sir yes sir the, the, once the uh, more proximal approach for adductor canal is used the quadri the chances of quadriceps weakness is, is higher and if we go distally so, the chances of quadriceps weakness is less but the intensity of analgesia also will become less but for tcr i think distally is better distal approach is best they want early rehabilitation early mobilization so that is distal is better for TKAs. I think uh, it is right. Just a few questions from uh, may I ask one question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajshekar, extremely good presentation. Like you yes, said, in you. the case of TKR, uh, you approach a, you have a multimodal approach towards block therapy, or you to take a single block and then you work accordingly. Ideally, it, uh, uh, in TKR, in total knee arthroplasties, both adductor canal block, uh, distal adductor canal block and IPAC block should be given, sir. Because right. adductor canal block uh, uh, takes care of the anterior capsule or anterior portion of the right. uh, joint and uh, the right. IPAC block covers the posterior aspect. So it posterior. should be given together sir, for right. complete analysis. Exactly, exactly. And uh, for example, if the patients, uh, most of the patients are sometimes diabetic as well. They have got a component of diabetic neuropathy as also. So uh, would you prefer uh, if suppose these patients are undergoing a total hip replacement, yes. then what is your choices of uh, regional blocks that you prefer for them? So, uh... For total hip replacement. Total hip replacement. Yeah. Peng block. Peng block can. You be... are pre you prefer only pen block. Peng block is not not a. It doesn't provide complete analgesia, sir. Right. Only a sixty to seventy percent analgesia. Analgesia uh, is provided. Yes, right. sir. Because so you prefer pen, pen the block, block and diabetic neuropathy. So you don't prefer a swas plexus block at the same time. You don't prefer that. It, it can be, it, it should be preferred, sir. It should be. If the, yes, basically in the case of diabetic patient, I feel that instead of going for central neuroaxial blockade, if we can use these two, I think that will be pretty beneficial after yes, spinal. Yes. Right. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Rashekar, one more question. Sure. There, you, you said that uh, post uh, in the uh, nerve supply of uh, posterior part of the knee joint, you yes, said sir. that mostly it is uh, the tibial nerve. So is there any literature we suggesting that we can selectively block a tibial nerve and uh, put a continuous catheter in? Uh... Yes, sir. The, there are continuous catheter techniques which are described, sir, but mo most of them are uh, uh, RCTs with smaller uh, sample size okay. the quality of uh, uh, literature is less more rcts are yet uh, are required to okay 
uh, is there any added advantage of uh, uh, or or any literature which suggesting that uh, uh, we can put uh, continuous uh, uh, catheter in ipac because generally if we are giving it say effect is uh, lastly for 4 to 6 hours yes sir so yes, sir. Are any uh, literature which suggesting that continuous IPEC block be given or? So, uh, sir, around uh, after it's in a, um, uh, after it was first described, around twenty four uh, publications have described uh, IPEC block, sir. Yeah. But the continuous uh, uh, techniques, con continuous catheter techniques, uh, uh, lack uh, uh, literature grounds, sir. Okay. There is not much of literature to support uh, continuous catheter techniques. Sir. Okay. The longest duration of uh, uh, duration of analgesia obtained uh, is sometimes up to eight to nine hours also, sir. So, but continuous catheter techniques uh, to use them, there is no. Uh, the, as of now, the the literature backing up is very less, sir. Around twenty to thirty articles. It's very close to a surgical site. So yes, that is one of the reasons. That is related and, uh, towards the stability issues. There is a foreign it is catheter. Stability, in... re stability related issues are there. That's why yeah, in the case very, of IPEG yeah. block, we don't place a, a, don't any kind of a catheter. continuous catheter because it can cause infection with the, because of the fluid that is present around there. That is the major concern. Okay. Yes. So distal adductor canal block is preferred. With that also, it is not preferable to put a catheter. The reason is that it is out to the medial aspect of the thigh. So sometimes because of the perineal area getting involved, the, that particular catheter can have infection. Mm -hmm. oh. But sir, rather than uh, uh, having this uh, indication, uh, this uh, reason for not putting the catheter in the IPAC block, the main indication I think is that the uh, uh, IPAC block is an infiltration block and we do generally prefer to put the catheter around the nerves. And in the IPEC, we don't find any there. There are the gen general branches which supply the joints. So there is no single way to put the catheter around which we can put the catheter and can, can do the continuous catheter technique. Sir, but uh, Sadiq, sir, sir, but... in the case of uh, actually IPEC block, I agree to it that it is a group of nerves that are being blocked. But if we see to it, when we are giving the brachial plexus block also in the axillary region or, the, or that region, I prefer to, when we put up a catheter, it is always a group of nerves that is being blocked. You are absolutely correct in saying that a group of nerves can't be blocked without a catheter, but with the help of a catheter. If they can be blocked with the help of infiltration. But in spite of that, there have been continuous studies going on so that the catheter can be introduced over there and the continuous volume of local anesthetists uh, can be maintained, constantly being maintained around the nerves. But because of stability issues, they have not been successful. And the uh, similar funda is applied on the pen block also because uh, the, uh, we are we are targeting the uh, genicular branches uh, which which are supplying the hip joint uh, genicular branches from the femoral nerve from the obturator nerve as well as from the lateral femoral nerve uh, they are supplying the joint the hip joint and we are targeting that joint so the continuous cutting technique is also I think I think uh, it is not uh, of too much interest to the uh, reason anesthetist for putting the catheter around the, uh, in the pen block. Any uh, comments from the experts? Sir? Yeah, Dr. Rashmi, any uh, more question? Uh, Dr. Archikar, you prefer? Do you prefer routinely playing playing block in uh, THR? Earlier we had sci-fi blocks supplying vinyl facial lacquer block. So, mm -hmm. how do you think playing is different or better than sci-fi block? Madam, uh, literature suggests that the analgesic effect of uh, the, these two blocks is, is almost the same, madam. But uh, motor sparing effect is better with pen block. Even sensory paresthesias are lesser in pen block. Yes, ma'am. And uh, the quality because only seventy percent uh, of the uh, of the uh, I mean, since we are blocking the anterior capsule alone. Though it is theorized that the uh, that the that the uh, uh, drug seeps into the planes and involves the posterior capsule also, but uh, 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 most of the literature suggested either comparable results 
uh, in terms of uh, degree of analgesia and uh, requirement of rescue analgesia and worst vas scores and uh, or uh, they, they said that the penglock is e e at, le at least equal to or inferior to uh, conventional blocks followed previously now we since that is say they are uh, peng is better peng is equally uh, better than a cyclic block uh, motor sparing is definitely there even sensory uh, patient doesn't have a sensory deficit and optical the nerve is uh, that was spared in that uh, cyclic block so uh, here it is also come also okay. thank you it was very thank nice you, yeah yeah thank you, thank you dr asagar it was excellent presentation yeah thank over you, to sir. dr bharat okay uh, thank you dr uh, rakesh dr rashmi and dr rasikar now we are moving to our next uh, uh, part of the today's academic activity that is the panel discussion on the uh, complications of the block for that i would like to uh, invite the chairperson for the next session uh, we have with us uh, uh, our first chairperson is uh dr pradeep kumar bhatia uh, he is the hod and uh, uh, department uh, uh, head of department of the department of anesthesia and critical care at aim jodhpur uh, he has a multiple publication to his credit and uh, uh, i am very lucky that i am the one of the student of the sir uh, uh well sir, please allow me to share okay, screen uh, please allow me to share screen so that i can project uh, bhatia sir cv Uh, yes, please. I am being. Uh, my CV is not required, yar. Yeah? Uh, panelist CV is more important. My CV is not required. So anyhow, sir, I I won't be able to share anyone's CV if I am not allowed to share the screen, sir. Okay. Host has disabled participant. Wait, I'm just, wait, uh, wait, sir, please. I'm just making you. Just, just. So, uh, inviting our next chairperson for the session. Uh, Dr. Shobha Parikman. Uh, he is the senior consultant at the uh, Goen Hospital and Research Center, Jodhpur. Uh, Ma'am has a keen interest in the regional anesthesia. Uh, welcome, Ma'am. Dr. Bharat, you have been made the co-host. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the moderator for the uh, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bharat Paliwal. He is working as additional professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at AIMS Jodhpur, and uh, 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 he has uh, more than 50 publications uh, to his uh, uh, credit. And his areas of interest are intensive care medicine and interventional pain management. Welcome, Dr. Bharat. Over to Dr. Bharat. Thank you, Dr. Sade. so uh, with permission of Bhat pradeep bhatia sir and shobha parik madam uh, i would like to start the session uh, uh, so today we will have a, we will be having panel discussion on the topic complications of the peripheral nerve block and uh, what are the causes and how we can curtail them uh, this session will be uh, panelists uh, will be i will like to introduce the panelists first So our first panelist is Dr. Vipul Kaushik, sir. Many thanks, Bharat ji. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sir, sir is uh, consultant. Sir is consultant. Sorry. Sorry. Sir is consultant in, in Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. and he is the ex head at uh, lister general hospital sir is the lead of orthopedic anesthesia awake upper limb unit he has affiliations to royal college of anesthesia a gpi and asra his achievements include more than 15 publications in pubmed listed journals and his areas of interest is regional anesthesia and cardiac intensive care we welcome you sir our next panelist is our next panelna mangal ma'am our next panelist is dr vanna mangalam ma'am she is senior professor in department of anesthesia and critical care at sms hospital jaipur she is the member of panel that had laid the isa pre operative guidelines she is the scientific chair of isa on 
The member of Board of Studies of Academy of Regional Anesthesia. She is the president elect of ISSP Jaipur chapter. So we welcome you, Vanda, ma'am. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you so much. So I would our next uh, chairperson is uh, Dr. Ganesha. He is currently working as associate professor at Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at AIMS Mamlagiri. He has currently organized an ultrasound guided regional anesthesia CME and workshop, uh, the first at the institute. He is the fa faculty member of Cambridge Royal uh, Regional Anesthesia UK workshop and has conducted CME over there. He is the member of the team which had started daycare orthopedic procedures at Edinburgh's hospital in UK. He has formulated guidelines on nerve injury uh, that is still available at uh, NHS Trust. And he is the member of editorial board of several journals, including GOCP, Indian Journal of Clinical Anesthesia, and the Indian Anesthetic Forum. His areas of interest is regional anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia, and hepatobiliary anesthesia. Welcome, Gansha. Thank you so much. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, our final speaker, Dr. Uh, Sadiq Mohammed. He is currently working as an additional professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at AIMS Jodhpur. He is, a, he is a fellow of Indian Diploma in Regional Anesthesia. He has more than eight chapters in book, published in the book and more than 60 international and national journals uh, publications. He has a patent to his name uh, in the form of single human double curvature tube uh, uh, with uh, Pratip Bhatia sir. And his areas of interest is critical care, regional anesthesia and cardiac anesthesia. Welcome, Dr. Sadiq. Thank you. So uh, today we'll be starting the uh, panel discussion. Uh, to begin with, uh, first of all, I would like to invite Dr. Vipul Kaushik, sir. Sir, I would just like to discuss a scenario with you. A uh, 68-year-old 60 year female patient uh, who is a known case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, she is posted for uh, total shoulder replacement. Uh, and uh, you prefer to choose the interscalinary block for this uh, patient. Uh, uh, the, uh, following the block, you also plan to give the general anesthesia. So I would like to, uh, uh, we all would like to know what all things you would like to ensure uh, before proceeding for block for general anesthesia. So what will be your concern part and uh, how will you prepare for it? Over to Vipul Kaushik, sir. Sir, am I audible? I think uh, sir has lost connection. So we will reserve this question for him. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Manna Mangan, ma'am. Uh, Madam, I would like to, uh, as the, our top, uh, topic of today's session is regarding the nerve injury, so I would like to request you to please inaugurate the causes of nerve injury uh, that can develop in this patient, patient with rheumatoid arthritis posted for total shoulder replacement. So, causes uh, in general if... and cause, causes that, that are specific to this patient, ma'am. So, so... Uh, specific to this patient. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, specific to this patient that this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. So, must have received a lot of medication and disease-modifying agents and steroids and so many things. So, if it has been there for a very long time, which it understandably has been, because he needs a shoulder replacement. Uh, so, pre-existing neuropathy is a concern in these patients. And when patients have neuropathy because of some systemic illness, then they become more prone to, uh, their nerves are more vulnerable to injury and sequelae. Although peripheral nerve blocks, the incidence of uh, nerve injuries well, is very low. It's very low. It is about uh, 1.5 per 10,000. And actually it is not well documented because there are no large series and the studies are very heterogeneous. So one cannot exactly do a meta-analysis to find out what exactly is the incidence. But the 
major cause which the literature says is the pressure at which we are injecting in all patients, even in normal healthy patients, it is the pressure of injection which matters most and any compromise of the vascularity of the nerve. As we all know that the nerves are, have dual nerve, uh, blood supply, one is the internal and one is the external. So if there is a pre-existing or a compromise because of, for any reason. So these are the two major concerns. Now, what has always been talked about was intraneural injections. Now, after having understood the anatomy of the nerves, so it really is not so easy to be causing damage, mechanical damage to the nerves by injecting drugs unless we do an intrafesicular injection. Now, the literature also says that the incidence of nerve injuries is almost similar. Whatever guidance has been used, either it has been landmark, PNS or USG. And the incidence of injury, whatever the extent of injury, that is generally not very severe. Little paresthesias, majority of them, they would resolve within uh, three to four hours or 24 hours. Usually they don't last beyond seven uh, days and definitely not beyond three months. We ourselves have done a study although not a very large series, about 800 cases. Uh, it's an unpublished data. Uh, and uh, we, have, we did not come across any patient uh, who had persistent uh, neurological deficits even after, and we followed them for six months. So there were hardly any beyond three months. And even at that point of time, the incidents were very low. But although we have to be careful, we cannot say that if we don't see it, we should not be careful. Yes, we do have to be careful. And when we're doing USG guided blocks, we have to be very careful to see that when we are injecting the drug, if there is nerve swelling, that is the time we have to stop. And we have to use pressure monitors, injecting pressure monitors, because they say you might not feel it, but the actual injury happens because you might clinically not perceive it. Uh, some literature even goes to the extent of saying that when you are intraneural, the PNS will not be able to detect it. Only ultrasound will show a nerve swelling. That is one objective evidence which, so, which shows that you've done an intrafesicular injection. And the injury to a nerve can only be done if it is an intrafesicular injection. Also, if we use very high concentrations of the drug, local anesthetic, and very high doses. So if a lot of drug is lying around, it definitely will cause neurotoxicity. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, as we have uh, learned from your discussion that uh, we have three modes of uh, blindly through the anatomical approach, uh, through the peripheral nerve stimulator and the ultrasound guidance. My next question is to Dr. Ghansham. So uh, what is uh, of the three modes which mode do you usually prefer? Uh, so, we, after the three modes, which mode do you usually prefer? Uh, anatomical, PNS, and uh, an ultrasound, and uh, why? So, as Madam was rightly saying, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. So, as Madam was rightly saying, that uh, uh, the incidence of nerve injury. So, there are, yes, we all know that there are two types of nerve injuries. Either it can be transient or it can be permanent. When we look into the literature, the incidence of transient nerve injury is as high as 6 to 10% in the days immediately following the blocks. So if you follow up these patients over a period of time, the incidence decreases to about 4 to 6% at the end of 4 to 6 weeks, and it is less than 1% at the end of a year. This means majority of our patients which are have, who are having a transient nerve injury are resolving, they are recovering on their own, and they are having a very good prognosis without any long-term side effects. The incidence of permanent nerve injury is very, very less. It is about one to four per 10,000 nerve blocks what we do. So the question arises is which one we should use, whether we should use an ultrasound guided one, we should use an ultrasound guided with peripheral nerve stimulator, or there is a triple monitoring nowadays, which is called as a combination of ultrasound with peripheral nerve stimulator with injection pressure monitoring. 
For this, we need to compare the data which was published before the era of the ultrasound and after the era of the ultrasound. So when we look into the literature, there is absolutely no difference in terms of nerve injury prior to the ultrasound era, post ultrasound era. So this raises a question, why ultrasound has not helped us in decreasing the incidence of nerve injury, though we are very well aware of so many advantages of using the ultrasound for performing the peripheral nerve blocks. Yes, the results are a bit disappointing when it comes to the nerve injury thing. So there are different explanations which are given in uh, literature uh, saying why ultrasound has not helped us. So I'm just going to briefly touch on them and then I will leave it to you people to choose the one which makes more sense to you. So the first theory which was say was that nerve performing a peripheral nerve block was never among the first few important causes of causing a nerve injury. So the causes were either there were the patient factors, as Madam was telling, the patient might be having some comorbidities. It could be the anesthetic factors. It could be the surgical factors. The peripheral nerve block comes fourth or fifth on the list. So as we haven't made any significant progress or any significant changes in the first three or four causes, the incidence of nerve injury has remained the same pre or post era of the ultrasound. The second explanation is that when we were using peripheral nerve stimulator or we were relying on the parasthesia technique before the era of the ultrasound, we do not have the numbers to say in what percentage of the patients we were taking our needle close to the nerve. We have the incidence, okay, what was the success rate? We all know, but whether the needle was lying inside the nerve, it was lying outside the nerve, where it was lying, we do not know. Now, post era of the ultrasound, what has happened is now we are intentionally taking the needle close to the nerve we are depositing the local anesthetic with or without adjuvant close to the nerve. So theoretically speaking, after the era of the ultrasound, the nerve injury should have gone up because now we are aiming for the nerve in all of our patients, except when we are doing the field blocks, that's a different question. But as the incidence has still remained the same, we can assume that ultrasound has actually helped us in decreasing the incidence of nerve injury. But I agree, we do not have the data to prove this notion. And as Madam was saying, it is the intrafascicular nerve injections which will result in nerve injury rather than the extrafascicular. Yes, the needle might be lying within the nerve, but if it is lying outside the fascicle, it will not result in nerve injury. But the problem is the resolution which we get with the present ultrasound machines, which we are using these days, it is very difficult to say in all the cases whether the needle is lying intrafascicular or extrafascular. That is why the nerve injury incidence has remained the same. But uh, to answer whether we should use only a peripheral nerve stimulator or an ultrasound, the recommendations are to use a triple monitoring. You should always use an ultrasound along with your peripheral nerve stimulator, and you should also monitor your injection pressures. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gansha. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, the, the cause is multifactorial, and uh, the peripheral nerve injury cannot be isolatedly blamed to the uh, technique or the nerve block per se. Yeah, just to add on to it, there are uh, meta-analysis um, uh, also there in which under direct vision intraneuronal injection was accomplished, still the patient uh, recovered and they did not have a permanent neurological injury. Yes, yeah, so that means that intrafascicular injection doesn't mean the patient will have nerve injury, no. Yeah, yeah. and so. second thing, as you said that uh, with PNS also, uh, we used to stimulate and uh, guide it, but again, PNS was also uh, not confirmatory because at 0.5 milliampere, which is a usually our threshold cutoff for nerve proximity, even the voltage higher than that has achieved uh, when the nerve was uh, internal. So, um, or lesser voltage was achieved when the nerve was internal, but still they didn't uh, any conclusive evidence with respect to the nerve. I agree. Uh, yeah. And I think Dr. Vipul Kaushik is online now. Sir, are you online? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I just dropped my signal where I am at the moment. Uh, I'm a little bit farther away. So I just yeah. dropped my signal, but my apologies for that. Uh, so, sir, we welcome you back. So, um, yeah, sir, I would like to inquire that, uh, suppose a patient, uh, as I had already put up the question, but uh, we had lost you. So, uh, a 68 or 70 years old female with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, mm -hmm posted for uh, total shoulder replacement. So if uh, you plan to do it under uh, uh, intricate scalene brachial plexus block and uh, the patient wants that a GA should follow. So what are your concerns uh, uh, regarding it? Means how will we go ahead with it? Uh, 
what will be your preparation about how you will be your consent pattern and how will your counseling would be there sir we would like to know yeah sure so a uh, 60 year old lady with the rheumatoid posted for shoulder replacement uh, river shoulder probably yeah so she would definitely benefit with an intercalene block as we know uh, plus for these river shoulder general anesthetic is important because surgeon would need some form of muscle relaxant uh, relaxation so uh, the common thing is common the The, there are some theoretical risks of certain things, and there are some practical risks of certain things. So we leave the general anesthetic behind because this topic is mainly focused on the regional anesthetic. Commonly, my practice is I make patients aware of nerve damage, which can either be temporary or permanent. And the other thing which I commonly talk to patient is risk of failure, the failure of the block that it may not work. we also touch slightly on infection inflammation some bleeding i don't as much talk nowadays about local anesthetic toxicity because it's been years when I mean, i've been doing anesthetics now close to 20 years touch wood but we are generally careful but haven't seen local anesthetic toxicity in last 15 years probably ultrasound we may give contribution to ultrasound for that that we always visualize and in terms of nerve damage i give them a quote them a figure of somewhere around 1 in 10000 1 or 2 in 10000 roughly around that mark and for permanent nerve nerve damage it goes to somewhere around 1 in 100000 or maybe more and most of the patients are generally quite quite okay with that and they do accept the risk bearing in mind that everything has good risk versus benefits and the benefit of a good analgesia them able to not be in, in severe pain after that kind of an operation because rheumatoid arthritis as we know they it's a it's a multi system disorder it may have affect their nerves along with other body systems and if analgesia is good it does reduce the incidence of any perioperative coronary syndromes which is quite important and also we practice quite a lot of these patients they they may go home the very same day because in nhs nowadays is severe lack of beds so we try and get them home very same day so with a good analgesia with some oral medications they can go home so that's one big benefit of practicing regional anesthetic so those are the common things what i talk about to them and we do talk about that should commonly these these blocks will last about 14 to 16 hours hence if you do them at first in the morning or the mid morning they've gone home the risk of finding themselves in severe or acute pain in the middle of night is huge so we blow them up with lots of oral medications and tell them that if there is any problem to contact us we do give them a number where they can talk and so far we had been fine we don't get much problems with that but those are the main things we talk about was that your question yes sir uh, thank you very much uh, uh, so uh, as we had learned from the discussion till now that uh, peripheral nerve injuries uh, are unavoidable although the incidence is very less mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so i would like to request uh, dr sadik uh, suppose the same patient uh, with an eventful procedure lands up to you after 40 hours and says that paresthesia is still not subsiding so are you worried about these things or or what will be your cut off for concern dr sadik please dr sadik is available please unmute yourself dr sadik please unmute yourself okay okay sorry uh, go ahead. so basically uh, whenever a patient after performing a peripheral nerve block or after an orthopedic surgery if he complains of the paresthesia and uh, numbness in the uh, area uh, in the limbs where the block was given then we should suspect it, uh, it uh, is to be a peripheral nerve injury uh, and that may be because of the we as, as we have already discussed that may be because of the block related or the other factor like surgical factor or the patient related factor but we should keep in mind and uh, whenever uh, uh, this happens uh, the adequate diagnosis and management is very important so for the diagnosis uh these symptoms history and physical 
do in all the cases uh, for the uh, uh, perioperative complications. It is uh, this the symptoms, sensitivity, and physical examination is important. So the symptoms which may appear immediately after the blocks, uh, after the resetting of the block, or it may uh, appear uh, even uh, the weeks or days or weeks after the uh, blocks. Uh, uh, second thing, the symptoms also depends upon the severity of the injury which happens during the uh, procedure. So if it is a mild injury that may lead to the mild tingling sensation and uh, if it is the severe injury, then it may lead to the sensory or the uh, progressive symptoms with the sensory or the motor involvement. Second thing, the history and physical examination also that uh, uh, is of vital importance to uh, uh, to label it uh, that it uh, this this uh, particular symptoms is due to the this this peripheral nerve which is because of the peripheral nerve blocks itself or it may be due to the patient related or the surgical uh, or the surgery related factor so uh, it, it it helps in ruling out the uh, site of uh, injury second thing comes the uh, diagnosis uh, after the symptoms physical symptoms in examination uh, some uh, the diagnostic workup can also be done uh, to uh, diagnose it. So for the diagnosis purpose, the EMG, the, that is the electromyogram, and the nerve conduction studies are very important. Uh, the, as we all know that the electromyogram, it, uh, uh, it basically quantitates the, uh, 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 the current generated by the muscle, while the nerve conduction study it uh, tells you about the conduction of the impulse around the nerve. So there is a, a fixed pattern of the nerve conduction. Uh, and uh, when, uh, so the NCS tell you about the degree the level of the conduction block, where the, exactly the nerve blocks occur. Very so so we, uh, we can, uh, uh, after uh, uh, having the adequate uh, history and physical examination, if the patient is having just tingling and uh, uh, sense, tingling sensation of the numbness and that is recovering, so we can just reassure the patient to relieve his anxiety and uh, we can ask the patient to come for the follow up after two to three weeks uh, because uh, before two to three weeks, the electrophysiological studies are not recommended because, uh, because, because this time is allowed for the valerian generation regener uh, regeneration to take place. So we can ask the patient to uh, follow follow up after two three weeks. Second thing, if the patient is having the severe symptoms at the time uh, or the sense uh, motor involvement, then we should uh, take uh, the cross references from the neurology, the neurological examination, and uh, uh, to uh, find out the other causes of the nerve injury. There may be uh, compartment syndrome or the because of the plaster. So we should also uh, take into consideration these. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sadi. Uh, so, uh, can I so we, can I add something at this? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one is tunica injury, and another is that earlier discussion that we were doing. In that, um, uh, the nerves as they go peripherally, the supporting tissue increases, so the chances of nerve injuries decrease. So, block should preferably be done as distally as possible although you are, we all do proximal blocks. But if uh, one can do away with a more distal one, one should opt for it. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question, Bharat? Yes, ma'am, please. Uh -huh. I have a question for Vandana Mangal, ma'am. Ma'am, you were talking about the uh, monitoring by the opening injection pressure. Uh, well, uh, the opening injection pressure, uh, I just wanted to ask, does it very reliably detect needle nerve contact? And if, it ah. is, if, and if it does, uh, is it similar for all the nerves in that scenario? Uh, I'm sorry, I have no practical experience. It's only that the literature that I've gone through and whatever yeah. is the literature saying, we don't have one at our institute and I've not used one. But people who are using it say, yes, it does. It is a useful device. Is it the same for all the nerves? I just wanted to ask if uh, some, all uh, other, other panelists can answer me. Any other panelist? Doctor, the... one question, sir. Uh, probably, sir, can uh, throw the light if he has so, any injection okay. pressure monitoring. Yes, uh, is it similar for all nerves? Do we have the same sensitivity as it is for other nerves? Is it same for all the it, nerves? It, it should be. It should be logically. It should be. 
Madam, I read in some literature that uh, it is not same for all the nerves. I don't know how far it is no. true. Uh, it it uh, is different for uh, some nerves like femoral nerves. Yeah. Vipul Gautam, sir. Comments, please. Many thanks, Bharat. Yeah, madam, I, I do have some experience with using uh, using these pressure monitors. They are a very small blob kind of thing where yeah. it gets attached and it limits the pressure. So B Braun is the company who came up and they they, they Bajin, supply so. us with that. G, hmm. uh, even Payong has come up with that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it was B Braun who initially brought it. Now it's also depends on what kind of syringe you are using, you know, because pressure is what force per unit area. So if it's inversely proportional to area, so if area is less, pressure is high. So that thing limits and it tells you only gauges what the pressure per square inch, hence PSI is. Now it is variable for different nerves. You're quite right because all nerves, because based on the size of the nerves, the pressure would vary. Yeah. Now the standard of the needle or the gauge of the needle is 22 gauge for majority of our uh, block needles. However, some people do find different needles. There are a variety of needles available as well. You can use as you know various needles. So everything has to be consistent and same with every block and everything you do. Then you can correlate the two, two things together. Otherwise, it, it is very variable. And also operator, the pressure what would be would we be for me and a 10 ml syringe might be variable for you. Hence, that pressure guide tells you an exactly like what the pressure is. Yes, sir. Now, also, as you correctly stated that, or other ma'am stated that as we go down distally, the stromal tissue increases. And hence, the rule or the guide what we talk about is above the clavicle, all the nerves are hypoechoic. Below the clavicle, they are hypoechoic. And it's basically because of the stromal tissue. The more of that tissue increases, the risk of nerve damage reduces significantly. Going above the clavicle, because since was a top talk was about the uh, interscalene block, above the clavicle, now people are also talking rather than interscalene block, just do the superior truncal block. There's a lot of literature around it. So you can just block the superior trunk, which is C5, C6, and it just rests underneath the inferior belly of Omo Haye. And if you put about, say, 10, 12, 15 ml of local anesthetic, with not a very high concentration, it works like teach. You wouldn't have any problems with local anesthetic, A, toxicity, B, nerve damage, C, uh, the efficacy of the block, uh, and uh, also that you know you have a very good analgesia. If you do want to do something like tough repairs and subacromial decompression, you can still get away by just putting that much of volume, 10, 15 mLs. That's my standard, and I do a lot of awake, uh, these kind of surgeries. But which patient has come with what kind of injury and what injury they have already sustained in their lifetime, we never know. We work on an assumption that all patients are fine and they are normal. Pre-existing injuries, pre-existing undiagnosed uh, medical condition, charcoal-laden kind of uh, charcoal Mary Tooth disease. I had one patient who was with that undiagnosed and she came and she did have a nerve injury. We investigated her and later she was diagnosed with that and she had nerve conduction studies and all her nerves were quite sick and she had a nerve uh, nerve block and she did present with some paresthesia and some transient nerve damage but it was we always we are very good in beating ourselves that oh we have done some damage but we forget that patient may have something which we are unaware of or even they may be unaware of and later when we find out coming back to the point about this pressure monitoring it is variable for different nerves it's operator dependent and also, don't forget that even the device sometimes can malfunction. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. That's very nice, really. You're very Thank welcome. You, Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Vipul, uh, we will switch on uh, to the other aspects of the peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, uh, for instance, the vascular injury. Uh, so, the infection, infection part. So, sir, we would like to know uh, what is the incidence of infection and uh, whether choosing a, a single shot technique or placing a catheter, uh, the decision is affected by the, uh, the incidence of infections. What, what is your opinion, sir? Yeah, Bharat, it's a very, uh, very difficult question to answer because the incidence of infection, uh, first of all, by a single shot 
is pretty, pretty low. And I think it's very operator stroke institutional dependent as well. There might be case reports where people are found across, oh, we had this infection of this kind or that kind. But if you maintain them in the single shot technique, yes, everything should be aseptic, but we have gone to ANTT, what is called as aseptic non-touch technique. So any catheter placement, that definitely warrants sterile technique, you know, gown, gloves and everything, make your sterile field and keep it as clean as possible. Use chlorhexidine. Uh, Raj Shekhar very nicely talked about you're doing a block, you know, chlorhexidine and avoiding and minimizing any introduction of any bugs which may be on this uh, on the skin and hence 0.5% chlorhexidine 30 seconds apart is very useful. One thing we commonly forget is the ultrasound gel itself. How we do the block, how much of ultrasound gel are we taking with the needle inside to view that? Because we, we take care of the probe, but we forget that that gel will still be introduced in the patient's skin. There has been case reports where this gel has gone onto the nerves and it's heavily neurotoxic, even worse than the drug itself or the high concentration of drugs. So infection per se, if you're doing a single shot, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you use aseptic non touch technique, you're generally fine. But with a catheter placement, especially if you're doing something where in dirty areas like in axilla or in perineum, you know, when, I mean, in groin, then you should make sure that you've used and a good aseptic solution, whatever you use, chlorhexidine is better, but some places may use iodine. Uh, but if you're putting any catheter play or doing any catheter, tunneling is also good, reducing tunneling has shown evidence even for venous accesses that if you're tunneling, then it's it's it reduces the risk of infection. And same for epidural as well for that instance. And in, in our institute, the in last 15 years, again, touch wood, I think we haven't seen much infection after single shot, definitely. We have gone away from catheter because we moved more to day case surgeries now. So our catheter placement is really minimal. Only for patients who go on to the, the passive device for shoulders, mainly that, you know, they need to go on to that device. So they need a good analgesia. So they go on for catheter for two, three days. But the number of patients we do for those ones are about 10 to 15 per year. Thank you, sir. So our dilemma is to some extent because most of the patients receive pre-operative anti antibiotics before the surgery. So uh, usually uh, this concern comes when uh, exclusively catheters are inserted for pre-operative analgesia. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, sir. So uh, coming on to the next aspect. Bharat, the, can I add something? Can I yes, add something? Yeah. So what we are doing in our setup is that we are not using the ultrasound gel and we are using sterile 2% xylocaine gel. And another thing at times which we do is we use saline instead of gel. So there are two options. What sir was talking, Dr. Vishal was talking about the concern of introducing the gel inside. Uh, these are two things we do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, Madam, we would like to request you uh, uh, regarding the concern of intravascular injection. So, accidentally, although with USG, the incidence is very low, but so, possibly if you encounter uh, patients with intravascular injection, so what is the usual management plan? So, the usual management plan is uh, first and foremost, if the patient has arrested if something has gone unnoticed, because if it is going stepwise, like the CNS symptoms coming, the circumolar numbness and tingling and dizziness coming, then it is very good. It's easier to manage. But at times there are situations where someone is not alert because everyone takes uh, regional anesthesia, very cool and uh, laid back that nothing is going to happen. So, and you land up, with a patient who is arrested or in severe hypertension. So CPR should be immediately started in these patients because the key to success is earliest and sustained cardiac compressions. We have had a patient and I really don't know what happened in that patient, but 
that patient had a fracture clavicle that patient had a hematoma and i did a supraclavicular block usg guided and after about 45 minutes that patient suddenly had respiratory and cardiac arrest and we almost did a resuscitation for one and a half hours for that patient we did give lipid infusion also but that we did at a slightly later point of time uh, and uh, ultimately we could salvage that patient so giving midazolam aborting um, the seizures and obviously lipid does have a role lipid does have a role but a card starting cardiac compressions at the earliest is very very important if the patient has arrested or is in severe hypotension before you are able to do something else get oh. someone to start the massage thank you ma'am uh, i yes. just want to add a couple of points to this is that okay oh okay. Yeah, please go ahead so like local anesthetic systemic toxicity whenever you encounter it the first thing you do is you call for help because you need so many hands now because you cannot run for everything second thing when you look at the intralipid infusion the 20% intralipid infusion you have to give it at 50 ml per kg per hour most of the infusion pumps if you see if it's a 70 kg patient the infusion rate you need is 1000 ml per hour most of our infusion pumps were not compatible to go beyond 400 or 500 ml i don't know it depends on the what institute pump you are using so you need couple of pumps to give that infusion because you have to give it in 5 minutes and then there are recommendations that yes intralipid this local anesthetic systemic toxicity is reversible but you have to be very patient and then you have to carry on cpr for a long duration of time and if you have a cardio pulmonary bypass facilities at your center you should always always consider that because it is a reversible cause once the intralipid is in there is a chance that success of a reversal is very very high yes sir sir i have a i have a question to the faculty here my question is a very basic question we have been uh, discussing about the needle diameters and the pressures but finally what is the take home message i mean with, as the pressure goes as as the needle size decreases the pressure goes on increasing and as the needle size increases the pressure decreases but of course the chances of needle uh, the nerve injury increases so i would like to ask what from the faculty what is the take home message i mean what is the optimum size because the pressure if it is not done if it is not measured with the pressure manometers then of course the pressure will approximately approximately will remain same with everybody so so one thing is that the syringe size should not be big it should not be beyond a 10 ml syringe one should not try to use a 20 ml syringe that is very important because people generally try to use a larger syringe so use yeah. the smallest possible syringe which is uh, comfortable for you use extension lines and as far as because then switching syringes becomes easy and as far as the needle size is concerned yes you are right i personally am not a very big advocate of very fine needles so it should be a short bevel needle and an reasonable size 22 gauge is a reasonable size where you don't need too much pressure you can inject at a fairly good rate you don't to take too long and uh, you are unlikely to cause injury Thank you very much, ma'am. That that is all the confusion. Thank you very much. Anybody else can also I, please add to it. I, I'll agree with you, madam. But you said absolutely right, spot on. That you know we you do use twenty-two gauge needles, which are the standard sizes gauge wise, and they are forty-five degree bevel. Uh, that's cut it so that the skin penetration is easier. Uh, but i would say that you know we we are very used to using 20 ml syringes as well our syringes are nr fit and with them that was the idea to avoid any intravascular injections uh, uh, via cannula in uh, in a haste so ours are nr fit and nr fit uh, the both the needle and the syringes but 20 ml is standard but we don't use those pressure monitoring uh, things regularly when we do go when when i personally do any nerve block i just make sure that my needle is tangential and i'm not hitting the nerve directly if you hit the nerve directly then chances are that you may go intraneural then intravascular whatever you want to call it but if you are just outside the perineum in the sheath and if you put anything 10 15 ml generally you're fine the onset of the block may take you know a little bit longer if i'm doing a wake surgeries then 
I just tell them that, you know, just be patient with it. And if need be, I'm ready and prepared to give some supplemental local to the surgeon to just infiltrate for the initial bit. But I'm not too much worried about whether it will work or not. It has to work most of the time. The success rate is quite good. But yeah, I think we all, we all are, we have done lots of blocks. There's no substitute to common sense. Just go gentle with it. And don't work on an assumption that, yeah, I'll be fine. Take utmost precautions while doing, you're doing a nerve block. Whatever needle you use, be familiar with it. Know your kit well. Ultrasound, go tangentially. Sometimes you can also see the nerve toggling along the nerve. If you're inside, that the nerve will no move with the needle. And if the nerve, nerve is not moving with the needle, that's a simple thing that you're outside the nerve. Let the needle move rather than the nerve moving with the needle. That's another thing what we talk about. And just keep it simple and always look for the spread of the local anesthetic. If you can see the spread of the local anesthetic, then you're not inside a vessel. That will just save you a big, another big time. Thanks. That was my two pennies contribution. So, uh, Dr. Vipul, as we had uh, learned that you said that if I go away, so what uh, what do that mean? Means what is your routine practice? Whether you go for awake or you prefer to give blocks after uh, taking doing giving general anesthesia. And what now, practice it's very, you? Pardon? Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Now I get your question. So your question is whether will I do a block awake or would I do uh, a sleep? So if yes. I have, if I've got, uh, it's dependent on patient as well. Patient factors whether patient is happy to stay awake. I must say that, you know, for short surgeries like cuff repair or decompressions, these ones, if you're talking about just upper limb surgeries or say trisectomy, hand surgeries, palmar fasciectomies, these ones, I generally prefer to keep them awake because we are very used to having them as day cases and they can leave hospital sooner. And I do tell them that initially there'll be a tiny scratch and I talk, talk them about that when I'll be injecting the local anesthetic or when I'm close to the nerves, they may feel some electricity around their arm. So it will be, it may, they may feel or may not feel. So I prime them with that and they do buy the idea. We do give them a patient information leaflet to just have them a read of it, that what it would be like or what would be their journey for this procedure. Recommendation is always do the block awake. So if there's any problem with your block, if your intraneural patient will tell you, that's the biggest guide. And if anybody says for any reason, no, I can't, and I'm very fearful, needle phobic, and I can't just withdraw, you know, I can't just be having this idea, having a needle in my neck or somewhere being awake, then of course, I mean, we appreciate that, but we just tell them that there'll be increased risk of nerve damage. And if they're we do that uh, whilst they're asleep. I do know of some colleagues who do regular epidurals when I sleep patients as well, but it's, it's very individual dependent how do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about how many blocks you have done? It's a learning process. We all develop and start from being novice to efficient to proficient, then to being an expert. Uh, I think now I've got to a stage where I'm not very worried. Do I do them awake or do I do them asleep? But I think from early stages, it's always a good idea to do a block awake. And then you can also establish... So if, it's, yeah. if it's working, then it's fantastic. And you know that. And if you think that it's it's partial or something, then you can always do some peripheral nerve blocks. That's another benefit of keeping patients uh, awake. So, yes, uh, we understood that you would prefer to uh, do it awake. And uh, only if patient demands that it will be done under general anesthesia. Uh, what uh, we are more worried about is the litigation part. So, sir, what is your routine practice for documentation uh, to avoid any litigations? Yeah, that's a very good question because here, when you, when you do have something like that, then you are in big trouble. You almost have a year or two years worth of your private practice is good, can easily go away. So, for documentation side, and I, I generally tell them of what it is, and we have a pre-filled uh, things on the anesthetic card, and we do. Mark that very clearly, risk of nerve injury, damage, local anesthetic toxicity, and most importantly, is risk of failure, that it may not work. Because we, we only talk about successes, but 
failure of a block and them in then the patient afterwards being in pain is also quite a good going thing for litigation that oh i was in so much agony so much pain those are the things so, we go on so sir we understood that you get it documented consent but uh, what is your practice with regard to saving usg images or uh, keeping keeping the video files with the record uh, image sadly no yes, sadly that you know all ultrasound machines are we hope and you think that you know in this in your living in uk and doing things we can do that easily no we can't there's no provision for saving images you can save some but after say uh, if there's any patient you get the feel of the patient you know when you talk to them there might always be an odd one where you may get caught but initially we do save images but it's all get wiped out when it's the images get stored and then there's no capacity in the on the drive so they all get deleted so sadly no we don't have a record of that it's a good idea to have a record of that or even on the phone and you can just take a print it and leave it in the patient's notes that's something we thought of but again uh, it's not something what we practice regularly thank you sir can i can i add something yes ma'am please madam please so yes, so, so so what we can do is that we document properly the pre or operop neurological status if there is a neurological deficit it should be documented in the pre operative period itself that this and the patient should be made aware of it that this is a deficit which is existing because of trauma or any other reason that the patient has maybe a systemic illness and then uh, in our anesthesia notes we should properly document what block has been given what needle has been used what drug has been used at what depth did we encounter what drug what volume what concentration then assess the block see what modality did we use to what guidance did we use and then uh, the onset of sensory block motor block assessment documentation of this and then recovery so all these things should be documented because once in a while uh, we do get patients who are challenged and we have to give a central neuroaxial block so in those patients we see to it that we do, do not given adjuvant and we ensure that the return of motor and sensory power is documented on the ticket so uh, that in future there is no contention that this effect did not wear off uh thank you ma'am so a uh, lot of questions are there to be asked uh, but i have been having a keeping an eye on the clock as well uh, Uh, so uh, before uh, the time runs out i would just quickly ask uh, two two more important questions first is to dr ganesham uh, with regard to newer anticoagulants uh, what are the recommendations uh, well there are few newer oral anticoagulants i would just like to highlight them uh, they are dabigatran rivaroxaban apixaban and edoxaban so the first drug dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor d for d this is how i remember it the second d for dabigatran is it is a dialysis dependent that means if a patient has got a renal failure so that means the mechanism of elimination from the body is basically dependent upon the creatinine clearance or the patient's renal functions and the third d for dabigatran is it has got a specific antidote and it comes by the name idarucizumab so these are the three d's for dabigatran whereas the rest of the three drugs whether it is apixaban rivaroxaban or it is edoxaban in their spelling they have the letter xa that means they are factor 10a inhibitors that's why they are called as in that way so when we look at the guidelines whether they are published from the american society or from the european society the normal recommendation is to stop them for 2 to 3 half lives prior to you are performing the peripheral nerve block because after the three half lives we expect that about 87.5% of the drug has got eliminated from the body so the remaining one is not uh, not a concern to do a peripheral nerve block but these uh, guidelines so when it comes to dabigatran it is usually for 48 to 72 hours provided the patient's creatinine clearance is more than 30 if it is less than 30 as we know that it is going to accumulate in the body the recommendations are to stop it for at least 5 days prior to your performing the block when it comes to apixaban or rivaroxaban or edoxaban it is usually for 24 to 72 hours at most of the centers when even i was working at uk i believe dr vipul will agree with me that it was like for 48 hours we stop our rivaroxaban or apixaban 
provided the patient was taking like less than 15 milligrams. If it was a higher dose, we stop it for 72 hours. But again, these guidelines are basically when we are performing the intermediate or deep levels of block. For example, if I do want to do a peripheral nerve block, say for example, median and ulnar nerve block in the forearm, these guidelines are not very clear whether it will actually result in hematoma because there is no blood vessel around. So these guidelines do not apply when you are actually doing it for a superficial blocks. And uh, if you really want to test whether you are, if you are uncertain that whether that drug is still there in the body, whether I should be doing a block or not, there is a test which is called as the factor 10A assay because these drugs are actually acting on factor 10A. So these tests are available in UK and USA. So you can ask for the assay and then you say to know that whether the drug is still persisting in the body or not. But the PT, APTT, INR are not very, very specific. Yes, they are, will get a derange, they will get prolonged, but they are not specific to determine whether you can go ahead with the block or not. So one or two questions are popping up. I would uh, ask at the end of the session. Uh, so I would like to ask Dr. Sadiq, we had discussed a uh, few of the complications. Any of the other rare complications which we have missed, you would like to point it out? Dr. Sadiq? Uh, yes. Uh... So well, basically, uh, as we have uh, discussed since last uh, 45 minutes, uh, the rare complications of the peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, and a few of them we have discussed in detail, like peripheral nerve injury, like the intravascular injection, uh, and like the infection. And uh, other very few uh, are the very rare complications, uh, which are uh, uh, like uh, anaphylaxis or anaphylactic reactions. Uh, this, uh, mm, mm, what we can say, the local anesthetic induced methemoglobinemia, they are, they are also, they are, they also should be kept in mind. Uh, although we are not using uh, nowadays the local anesthetic which cause, which cause the methemoglobinemia, but one should also keep these rare complications in mind. Uh, thank you, Sabin. I think one more uh, unavoidable avoidable complication may be a wrong side block. So, yeah. block on a wrong side. So, uh, Ransham, uh, would you like to address this issue, how to prevent this and how to deal with it in case it happens? So, performing a wrong-sided block is called as a never event, which means in ideal circumstances, it should never happen, provided you follow the guidelines and you follow the checklist, because these are identifiable and definitely preventable. So if you look into the literature, there are a few causes when you may end up doing a block on the wrong side. The most important reason they have said is if there is a delay between WHO signing and doing the block. For example, if you encounter an unanticipated difficult airway or if you struggle with your spinal, in that tension with that 15 to 20 minutes, you have just completely forgotten which side the patient was posted for a block. The second reason could be there might be distractions in the anesthetic room. People are coming and going out. You are having a chat with somebody else. In that situation, you just completely again forgot which side it was. Third, it could be if the patient is turned into a prone position. So the sides are just reversed. You are doing it on the right side, but it is not actually the right side. So you have to be a bit careful. And sometimes I do see our junior trainees, our enthusiastic trainees, they are very much enthusiastic about doing the block. But what we need to tell them that you have to do it on the correct side also. Doing the block is fine. That's completely okay. And sometimes we do see our surgeons, they do not mark the surgical site. And if you cover up the surgical site, you do not know on which side you need to do the block. So what may happen? The most important thing which will happen is whatever the rapport you have built with the patient till that time, you have now lost it. Yes, you are going to apologize and tell him that I'm really sorry. But the patient will think that this is a doctor who is not cared about his job. That is true also because this was completely avoidable and preventable. The second, the worst thing which can happen is that the, the surgeon may trust you and they may end up doing the surgery on the wrong side. Other than that, yes, you if you want to do the block on the other side, you have to exceed the volume of the local anesthetic. There are a few blocks which you cannot do bilaterally. For example, if it is a shoulder surgery, you have done an interscaline, you cannot do the interscaline on the other side. You have to cancel the surgery, you have to postpone the surgery. There are other complications. But what needs to be done is the question. So there is a worldwide initiative. It's a patient safety initiative, and it is called a stop before you block. So the guidelines, what they clearly say is that the surgeon has to mark the surgical site in the ward or at least in the preoperative area after confirming it with the patient, but not in the theaters. Second, when you are doing a WHO sign in, you, the responsible surgeon and the technician who is helping you, all three, how to make sure that you have asked the patient 
and you have cross checked it with the consent and the surgical site is actually marked and then you proceed with your procedure whether you want to give a gva spinal or straight away the block the stop before you block moment says before you insert the needle into the patient skin you stop again and you take the help of your ota who is helping you or second anesthetist and if the and you cross check that you have seen the surgical site mark and you are cross verified with the the surgical site and then you proceed with your block the recommendations also say wherever you are doing these blocks these guidelines should be stuck onto the wall in your hospital area where you are doing these blocks and uh, uh, one important thing is when you are using the ultrasound you can keep this as a home screen of your ultrasound so whenever you turn on the ultrasound machine it should display that you stop before you block so you know that okay this is something i need to do before i proceed with the block. Uh, thank you, Doctor Ansham. Uh, one thing also I would like to add is a third-party checklist. So what you said, uh, the surgeon, the technician, and the anesthetist. Uh, in some areas, it is practiced that an uninvolved person, uh, the nurse in the in the pre-op area, she just uh, checks. So the, that is an additional security to prevent the long-sided block. Correct. Agree. So, uh, just uh, before summarizing, uh, it will be unfair to uh, not take uh, questions from the chat box. So, uh, one question I would like to put, uh, it's from Dr. Vitanjali Singhal. She wants to ask, is it right to conduct a nerve repair surgery under peripheral nerve block? Uh, over to Dr. Vishal Singhal, sir. Or... Uh, 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 to uh, okay, so uh, the only challenge if you face in a nerve injury, if you try to do it under regional anesthesia, you will block the proximal part of the nerve, but you will not be able to block the distal part of the nerve because if the nerve is completely severed, so then the distal part of the nerve is not blocked. So if it is partially injured, yeah, only the mm, Epineurium is injured, then the block will work, whatever level you give proximally. But otherwise, at times, there are situations, uh, if there is a complete severe, no, in the distal part, it's definitely not going to work. Okay, And still, if it is a partial injury, at times, there are situations, you get away with it. And there are situations when the surgeon touches the cut end of the nerve, the, patient, the damaged part, uh, the patients will complain of pain. So what we tend to do is that we ask the surgeon to infiltrate the injure, around the injured part. If we are very insistent on getting it done under regional anesthesia for other reasons that we don't want to give general anesthesia for systemic reasons. We want to avoid general anesthesia. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's your choice, but complete severing, distally it will not work. It will not work. Thank you. And it will, uh... Dr. Gitanji, I think uh, you must be satisfied with the answer. Uh, so to conclude it, uh, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Ranshaam to summarize the key point and the take-home message. The take-home message from this would be, yes, when you are uh, doing a peripheral nerve block, consenting is very, very important. So you always consent to your patients and explain them what is expected, what you are going to do, how you are going to perform the block, what are the expected complications? What are the rare complications? The second thing, when you are doing it, as I said, stop before the block is very, very important. So you always make sure that you are doing the block on the correct side. Third thing, as Dr. Vipul was rightly pointing out, infection. Yes, 0.5% chlorhexidine is the recommendation and I advise everyone to use 0.5% chlorhexidine two sprays 30 seconds apart and allow it to dry because Chlorhexidine itself is also neurotoxic. Whether use betadine, chlorhexidine, if you do not allow it to dry, even with your ultrasound gel, you are going to cause some neurotoxicity. So make sure that you always take some time and do it under always all precautions. If the patient is having uh, some antiplatelets, anticoagulants, make sure that you have stopped them appropriately before you do the block. And uh, consent, monitoring, and documentation is equally important because I most of the time I have seen that we, the way we document our blocks is like one or two lines, somewhere in the end of the anesthetic chart, you just write it. That's not the appropriate way, because if you end up having some litigations later on, you have nothing to prove what you have actually done. 
So you should always write in which side you have done it, who has done it, whether you have done the stop before the block or not, what antiseptic you have used, what's the gauge, what is the principle, whether I use ultrasound with peripheral nerve stimulator and all that. And as we were discussing, storing the images, because in Western worlds nowadays, they are using ultra, the electronic data to store all the data. So it is always feasible if you can connect the ultrasound machine with the electronic data and if you can transfer the data and keep it secure so that you are not breaching the confidentiality of the patient as well. But if in future you end up with litigations, you can just go through the images or the videos to see that what actually happened there, whether it is the peripheral nerve block which is causing the injury because we discussed it is not the most common cause. It is a very, very rare cause to cause peripheral nerve injury so that you can defend yourself. So that would be the take home message. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ancha. Just uh, one or two things uh, more to add. Uh, first is you said that these points should be mentioned at the end of the chart. Uh, I think uh, as we do routinely for other anesthetic uh, charting system that we have a pre-form format. So it will be good if we have a pre-form format that will avoid missing up the details. And it will ease our uh, work uh, of documentation. Yeah, so, yeah. No, no. What I was saying is, what I have seen is they write only two sentences at the end of the chart, which is right. You, you are rightly said. Yes, of course. You rightly said. You rightly said. Uh, uh, the same thing, if, if it is in a chart form, then it will be. Yes, released. of course. It will have all the Instead details. of writing. Yeah. True. And another thing is, uh, although uh, a lot of adjuvants are being used, some are uh, so and toxic. And some are not. But most importantly, uh, care should be taken with respect to epinephrine. So the usual concentration, one in two lakh is used. But for patients who are at risk of ischemia, a neural ischemia, a lower concentration of one in four lakh can be used. So uh, this one added point I would like to add. So uh, thank you, uh, all panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Vipul Kaushik, sir, Vanda Mangal, madam, uh, Ganesham Diani and Sadiq Mohammed. Uh, for an excellent discussion and uh, I thank the uh, chairpersons Pratip Bhatia and uh, Shobha Parikh madam for the session. Over to Dr. Sade. Uh, thank you very much. I hope the session was uh, very informative and uh, was, will be helpful for all those who have attended it. Uh, now we have uh, as uh, the pattern and the senior most faculty uh, the Dr. Tej K. Uh, calls sir. I would like to uh, invite uh, sir to say a few words. Nothing more, nothing more to be spoken. An excellent, an excellent panel discussion and the lecture. Very informative, very practical point. Learning for the beginner as well as the senior most person. Very valid, simple. And solid reasons to perform the block. All speakers, all panelists, chairpersons, the organizers, they all deserve congratulations. Top of it under the guidance of Dr. Indriani and Dr. Vishal. No words are there complete to thank them for their efforts they take to see that the academic program is going very, very smoothly and excellent. Thank you all. Long live our. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the kind words. Now, uh, to conclude the session, I would like to invite Dr. Bharat to uh, say a few things. Thank you, Dr. Sadiq. So, I feel honored and privileged to, uh, to produce the vote of thanks on behalf of uh, RSCP Jodhpur City branch. So, uh, to begin with, I would like to thank the office bearers, our mentor, uh, Dr. Tej Kaul, sir, Indrani Ma'am, Dr. Vishal Singla, sir, and, uh, and our uh, president-elect, uh, Naveen Malhotra, sir, for uh, constant motivation and guidance. Uh, we are encouraged and immensely benefited from your kind words and guidance. And uh, I would be uh, indebted to our chairpersons, speakers, panelists, who had produced a such an excellent discussion and a learning point for all the delegates. Uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, the pillar of our support, uh, Dr. Pradeep Bhatia, sir. So he has been guiding us and supporting us uh, at uh, RACP Jodhpur City branch. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And I express my deep regards on the behalf of the city branch, sir. 
and uh, i also wholeheartedly thank delegates who were uh, uh, con con continuously be associated with us and uh, their uh, inputs have added few more points to the discussion so uh, thank you all uh, delegates as well and uh, i hope this session was had been a learning opportunity for all of us i understand that uh, the time period is short and we have lot more to discuss by hope that we will meet soon and uh, continue the discussion so thank you all this is all from my side thank you all thank you thank you bharat it was extremely thank you special thanks to thanks everyone Ramesha. And long live thanks to Dr. Thank Ram Sharma and excellent discussion and we were immensely benefited by the experience of our faculty members thank you so much thank you everyone thank you for joining thank you everyone and good night please good night, good night. Thank thank long live thanks for having me as well thank you and good night take care long live our so city good night thanks a lot my dear sir good night navin morota sir thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank you all